Section thirteen of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section thirteen. Quia imperfectum. Nineteen eighteen. I have often wondered that no one has set himself to collect unfinished works of art. There is a peculiar charm for all of us in that which was still in the making when its maker died or in that which he laid aside because he was tired of it, or didn't see his way to the end of it, or wanted to go on to something else. The very globe we live on is a far more fascinating sphere than it can have been when men supposed that men like themselves would be on it to the end of time. It is only since we heard what Darwin had to say only since we have had to accept as improvisable what lies far ahead that the book of life has taken so strong a hold on us and once taken up cannot as the reviewers say readily be laid down the work doesn't strike us as a masterpiece yet certainly but who knows that it isn't that it won't be judged as a whole for sheer creativeness no human artist i take it has a higher repute than michelangelo none perhaps has a repute so high but what if michelangelo had been a little more persevering all those years he spent in the process of just a-going to begin pope julius's tomb and again all those blank spaces for his pictures and bare pedestals for his statues in the baptistery of san lorenzo ought we to regret them quite so passionately as we do his patrons were apt to think him an impossible person to deal with but i suspect that there may have been a certain high cunning in what appeared to be a mere lovable fault of temperament when michelangelo actually did bring a thing off the result was not always more than magnificent his david is magnificent but it isn't david one is duly awed but to see the master at his best back one goes from the academia to that marvellous bleak baptistery which he left that we should see in the mind's eye just that very best it was there some years ago as i stood before the half-done marvel of the night and morning that i first conceived the idea of a museum of incomplete masterpieces and now i mean to organize the thing on my own account the baptistery itself so full of unfulfilment and with such a wealth at present of spare space will be the ideal setting for my treasures there be it that the public shall throng to steep itself in the splendour of possibilities beholding under glass and perhaps in excellent preservation penelope's web and the original designs for the tower of babel the draft made by mr asquith for a reformed house of lords and the notes jotted down by the sometime german emperor for a proclamation from versailles to the citizens of paris there too shall be the manuscript of that fragmentary iphigenie which racine laid aside so meekly at the behest of mademoiselle de treves coque cela fut de mon mieux and there an early score of that one unfinished symphony of beethoven's i forget the number of it but anyhow it is my favourite among the pictures rossetti's oil painting of found must be ruled out because we know by more than one drawing just what it would have been and how much less good than those drawings but leonardo's saint sebastian even if it isn't leonardo's shall be there and whistler's miss connie gilchrist and numerous other pictures that i would mention if my mind were not so full of one picture to which if i can find it and acquire it a special place of honour shall be given a certain huge picture in which a life-sized gentleman draped in a white mantle sits on a fallen obelisk and surveys the ruined temples of the campagna romana the reader knits his brow evidently he has not just been reading goethe's travels in italy i have 
or rather i have just been reading a translation of it published in eighteen eighty five by george bell and sons i dare say it isn't a very good translation for one has always understood that goethe despite a resistant medium wrote well an accomplishment which this translator hardly wins one to suspect and i dare say the painting i so want to see and have isn't a very good painting wilhelm tischbein is hardly a name to conjure with though in his day as a practitioner in the historical style and as a rapturous resident in rome tischbein did great things big things at any rate he did crowds of heroes in helmets looked down at by gods on clouds he did centaurs leaping ravines sabine women sieges of troy and he did this portrait of goethe at least he began it why didn't he finish it that is a problem as to which one can but hazard guesses reading between the lines of goethe's letters the great point is that it never was finished by that point as you read between those lines you will be amused if you are unkind and worried if you are humane worried yet also pleased goethe has more than once been described as the perfect man he was assuredly a personage on the great scale in the grand manner gloriously balanced rounded and it is a fact that he was not made of marble he started with all the disadvantages of flesh and blood and retained them to the last yet from no angle as he went his long way could it be plausibly hinted that he wasn't sublime endearing though failure always is we grudge no man a moderately successful career and glory itself we will wink at if it befall some thoroughly good fellow but a man whose career was glorious without intermission decade after decade does sorely try our patience he we know cannot have been a thoroughly good fellow of goethe we are shy for such reasons as that he was never injudicious never lazy always in his best form and always in love with some lady or another just so much as was good for the development of his soul and his art but never more than that by a tittle fate decreed that sir willoughby patterne should cut a ridiculous figure and so earn our forgiveness fate may have had a similar plan for goethe if so it went all awry yet in the course of that pageant his career there did happen just one humiliation one thing that needed to be hushed up there tischbein's defalcation was a chip in the marble a flaw in the crystal just one thread loose in the great grand tapestry men of genius are not quick judges of character deep thinking and high imagining blunt that trivial instinct by which you and i size people up had you and i been at goethe's elbow when in the october of seventeen eighty six he entered rome and was received by the excited tischbein no doubt we should have whispered in his ear beware of that man he will one day fail you unassisted goethe had no misgivings for some years he had been receiving letters from this herr tischbein they were the letters of a man steeped in the sorrows of werther and in all else that goethe had written this was a matter of course but also they were the letters of a man familiar with all the treasures of rome all italy was desirable but it was especially towards great rome that the soul of the illustrious poet the confined state councillor of weimar had been ever yearning so that when came the longed-for day and the duke gave leave of absence and goethe closing his official portfolio with a snap and imprinting a fervent but hasty kiss on the hand of frau von stein fared forth on his pilgrimage tischbein was a prospect inseparably bound up for him with that of the seven hills baedeker had not been born tischbein would be a great saviour of time and trouble 
nor was this hope unfulfilled tischbein was assiduous enthusiastic indefatigable in the early letters to frau stein to herder and others his name is always cropping up for commendation of tischbein i have much to say and much to boast a thorough and original german he has always been thinking of me ever providing for my wants in his society all my enjoyments are more than doubled he was thirty-five years old two years younger than goethe and one guesses him to have been a stocky little man with those short thick legs which denote indefatigability one guesses him blond and rosy very voluble very guttural with a wealth of forceful but not graceful gesture one is on safer ground in guessing him vastly proud of trotting goethe round such fame throughout europe had goethe won by his works that it was necessary for him to travel incognito not that his identity wasn't an open secret nor that he himself would have wished it hid great artists are always vain to say that a man is vain means merely that he is pleased with the effect he produces on other people a conceited man is satisfied with the effect he produces on himself any great artist is far too perceptive and too exigent to be satisfied with that effect and hence in vanity he seeks solace goethe you may be sure enjoyed the hero worshipful gaze focused on him from all the tables of the cafe greco but not for adulation had he come to rome rome was what he had come for and the fussers of the coteries must not pester him in his golden preoccupation with the antique world tischbein was very useful in warding off the profane throng fanning away the flies let us hope he was actuated solely by zeal in goethe's interest not by the desire to swagger as a monopolist clear it is though that he scented fine opportunities in goethe's relation to him suppose he could rope his illustrious friend in as a collaborator he had begun a series of paintings on the theme of primeval man goethe was much impressed by these tischbein suggested a great poem on the theme of primeval man a volume of engravings after tischbein with running poetic commentary by goethe indeed the frontispiece for such a joint work writes goethe in one of his letters is already designed pushful tischbein but goethe though he was the most courteous of men was not of the stuff of which collaborators are made during our walks together and can you not see those two together pacing up and down the groves of the villa pamphili or around the ruins of the temple of jupiter little tischbein gesticulating and peering up into goethe's face and goethe with his hands clasped behind him ever nodding in a non-committal manner he has talked with me in the hope of gaining me over to his views and getting me to enter upon the plan goethe admits in another letter that the idea is beautiful only he adds the artist and the poet must be many years together in order to carry out and execute such a work and one conceives that he felt a certain lack of beauty in the idea of being with tischbein for many years did i not fear to enter upon any new tasks at present i might perhaps be tempted this i take to be but the repetition of a formula often used in the course of those walks in no later letter than november is the scheme mentioned tischbein had evidently ceased to press it anon he fell back on a scheme less glorious but likelier to bear fruit latterly writes goethe i have observed tischbein regarding me and now note the demure pride it appears that he has long cherished the idea of painting my portrait ernest sightseer though he was and hard at work on various manuscripts in the intervals of sightseeing 
it is evident that to sit for his portrait was a new task which he did not fear to enter upon at present nor need we be surprised it seems to be a law of nature that no man unless he has some obvious physical deformity ever is loath to sit for his portrait a man may be old he may be ugly he may be burdened with grave responsibilities to the nation and that nation be at a crisis of its history but none of these considerations nor all of them together will deter him from sitting for his portrait depend on him to arrive at the studio punctually to surrender himself and sit as still as a mouse trying to look his best in whatever posture the painter shall have selected as characteristic and talking if he have leave to talk with a touching humility and with a keen sense of his privilege in being allowed to pick up a few ideas about art to a dentist or a hairdresser he surrenders himself without enthusiasm even with resentment but in the atmosphere of a studio there is something that entrances him perhaps it is the smell of turpentine that goes to his head or more likely it is the idea of immortality so that he was specially susceptible to the notion of being immortalized the design is already settled and the canvas stretched and i have no doubt that in the original german these words ring like the opening of a ballad the anchor is up and the sail is spread as i and you belike recited in childhood the ship in that poem foundered if i remember rightly so that the analogy to goethe's words is all the more striking it is in this same letter that the poet mentions those three great points which i have already laid before you the fallen obelisk for him to sit on the white mantle to drape him and the ruined temples for him to look at it will form a beautiful piece but he sadly calculates it will be rather too big for our northern habitations courage there will be plenty of room for it in the baptistery of san lorenzo meanwhile the work progressed a brief visit to naples and sicily was part of goethe's campaign and he was to set forth from rome taking tischbein with him immediately after the close of carnival but not a moment before needless to say he had no idea of flinging himself into the carnival after the fashion of lesser and lighter tourists but the carnival was a great phenomenon to be studied all embracing goethe remember was nearly as keen on science as on art he had ever been patient in poring over plants botanically and fishes ichthyologically and minerals mineralogically and now day by day he studied the carnival carnivalogically from a strictly carnivalogical standpoint taking notes on which he founded later a classic treatise his presence was not needed in the studio during these days for the life-sized portrait begins already to stand out from the canvas and tischbein was now painting the folds of the mantle which were swathed around a clay figure he is working away diligently for the work must he says be brought to a certain point before we start for naples besides the mantle tischbein was doing the campagna i remember that some years ago an acquaintance of mine a painter who was neither successful nor talented but always buoyant told me he was starting for italy the next day i am going he said to paint the campagna the campagna wants painting tischbein was evidently giving it a good dose of what it wanted it takes no little time writes goethe to frau von stein merely to cover so large a field of canvas with colours ash wednesday ushered itself in and ushered the carnival out the curtain falls rising a few days later on the bay of naples re-enter goethe and tischbein bright blue backcloth incidental music of baccarolles etc for a while all goes splendidly well 
Sane Quixote and ascetic Sancho visit the churches, the museums, visit Pompeii, visit our ambassador, Sir William Hamilton, that accomplished man. Vesuvius is visited, too, thrice by Goethe, but, here for the first time we feel a vague uneasiness, only once by Tischbein. To Goethe, as you may well imagine, Vesuvius was strongly attractive. At his every ascent he was very brave, going as near as possible to the crater, which he approached very much as he had approached the carnival, not with any wish to fling himself into it, but as a resolute scientific inquirer. Tischbein, on the other hand, merely disliked and feared Vesuvius, he said it had no ascetic value, and at his one ascent did not accompany Goethe to the crater's edge. He seems to have regarded Goethe's bravery as rashness. Here, you see, is a rift, ever so slight, but of evil omen, what seismologists call a fault. Goethe was unconscious of its warning. Throughout his sojourn in Naples, he seems to have thought that Tischbein in Naples was the same as Tischbein in Rome. Of some persons it is true that change of sky works no change of soul. Oddly enough, Goethe reckoned himself among the changeable. In one of his letters he calls himself quite an altered man, and asserts that he is given over to a sort of intoxicated self-forgetfulness, a condition to which his letters testify not at all in a later bulletin he is nearer the mark were i not impelled by the german spirit and a desire to learn and do rather than to enjoy i should tarry a little longer in this school of a light-hearted and happy life and try to profit by it still more a truly priceless passage this with a solemnity transcending logic as who should say were i not so thoroughly german i should be thoroughly german tischbein was of less stern stuff and it is clear that naples fostered in him a lightness which rome had repressed goethe says that he himself puzzled the people in neapolitan society tischbein pleases them far better this evening he hastily painted some heads of the size of life and about these they disported themselves as strangely as the New Zealanders at the sight of a ship of war. One feels that but for Goethe's presence, Tischbein would have cut New Zealand capers too. A week later he did an utterly astounding thing. He told Goethe that he would not be accompanying him to Sicily. He did not, of course, say, the novelty of your greatness has worn off your solemnity oppresses me be off and leave me to enjoy myself in naples on sea naples the queen of watering-places he spoke of work which he had undertaken and recommended as travelling companion for goethe a young man of the name of kniep goethe we may be sure was restrained by pride from any show of wrath pride compelled him to make light of the matter in his epistles to the weimarians even kniep he accepted with a good grace though not without misgivings he needed a man who would execute for him sketches and paintings of all that in the districts passed through was worthy of record he had already heard kniep highly spoken of as a clever draughtsman only his industry was not much commended our hearts sink i have tolerably studied his character and think the ground of his censure arises rather from a want of decision which may certainly be overcome if we are long together our hearts sink lower kniep will never do kniep will play the deuce we are sure of it and yet such is life kniep turns out very well to gives the rosiest reports of the young man's cheerful ways and strict attention to the business of sketching it may be that these reports were coloured partly by a desire to set tischbein down but there seems to be no doubt that goethe liked kniep greatly and rejoiced in the quantity and quality of his work at palermo one evening goethe sat reading homer and making an impromptu translation for the benefit of kniep
who had well deserved by his diligent exertions this day some agreeable refreshment over a glass of wine this is a pleasing little scene and is typical of the whole tour in the middle of may goethe returns to naples and lo tischbein was not there to receive him tischbein if you please had skipped back to rome bidding his neapolitan friends look to his great compatriot pride again forbade goethe to show displeasure and again our reading has to be done between the lines in the first week of june he was once more in rome i can imagine with what high courtesy as though they were nothing to rebuke he treated tischbein but it is possible that his manner would have been less perfect had the portrait not been unfinished his sittings were resumed it seems that signora zucchi better known to the world as angelica kaufmann had also begun to paint him but great as was goethe's esteem for the mind of that nice woman he set no store on this fluttering attempt of hers her picture is a pretty fellow to be sure but not a trace of me it was by the large and firm historic mode of tischbein that he not exactly in his habit as he lived but in the white mantle that so well became him and on the worthy throne of the fallen obelisk was to be handed down to the gaze of future ages was to be yes on june twenty seventh he reports that tischbein's work is succeeding happily the likeness is striking and the conception pleases everybody three days later tischbein goes to naples incredible we stare aghast as in the presence of some great dignitary from behind whom by a ribald hand a chair is withdrawn when he is in the act of sitting down tischbein had as it were withdrawn the obelisk what was goethe to do what can a dignitary in such case do he cannot turn and recriminate that would but lower him the more can he behave as though nothing had happened johann wolfgang von goethe tried to do so and it must have been in support of this attempt that he consented to leave his own quarters and reside a while in the studio of the outgoing tischbein that slippery man does it is true seem to have given out that he would not be away very long and the prospect of his return may well have been reckoned in mitigation of his going goethe had leave from the duke of weimar to prolong his italian holiday till the spring of next year it is possible that tischbein really did mean to come back and finish the picture goethe had at any rate no reason for not hoping when you think of me think of me as happy he directs and had he not indeed reasons for happiness he had the most perfect health he was writing masterpieces he was in rome rome which no pilgrim had loved with a rapture deeper than his this wonderful old rome that lingered on almost to our own day under the conserving shadow of the temporal power a rome in which the emperors kept unquestionably their fallen day about them no pilgrim had wandered with a richer enthusiasm along those highways and those great storied spaces it is pleasing to watch in what deep draughts goethe drank rome in but i fancy that now in his second year of sojourn he tended to remain within the city walls caring less than of yore for the campagna and i suspect that if ever he did stray out there he averted his eyes from anything in the nature of a ruined temple of one thing i am sure the huge canvas in the studio had its face to the wall there is never a reference to it by goethe in any letter after that of june twenty seventh but i surmise that its nearness continually worked on him and that sometimes when no one was by he all unwillingly approached it he moved it out into a good light and stepping back gazed at it for a long time i wonder that tischbein was not shamed telepathically to return what was it that had made tischbein not once but thrice 
abandoned Goethe. We have no right to suppose he had plotted to avenge himself for the poet's refusal to collaborate with him on the theme of primeval man. A likelier explanation is merely that Goethe, as I have suggested, irked him. Forty years elapsed before Goethe collected his letters from Italy and made a book of them, and in this book he included, how magnanimous old men are, several letters written to him from Naples by his deserter. These are shallow but vivid documents, the effusions of one for whom the visible world suffices. I take it that Tischbein was an historic painter, because no ambitious painter in those days wasn't. In Goethe the historic sense was as innate as the aesthetic, so was the ethical sense, so was the scientific sense, and the three of them, forever cropping up in his discourse, may well be understood to have been too much for this simple Tischbein. But, you ask, can mere boredom make a man act so cruelly as this man acted? Well, there may have been another cause, and a more interesting one. I have mentioned that Goethe and Tischbein visited our ambassador in Naples. His Excellency was at that time a widower, but his establishment was already graced by his future wife, Miss Emma Hart, whose beauty is so well known to us all. Tischbein, wrote Goethe a few days afterwards, is engaged in painting her. Later in the year, Tischbein, soon after his return to Naples, sent to Goethe a sketch for a painting he had now done of Miss Hart as Iphigenia at the sacrificial altar. Perhaps he had wondered that she should sacrifice herself to Sir William Hamilton. "'I like Hamilton uncommonly,' is a phrase culled from one of his letters. And when a man is very hearty about the protector of a very beautiful woman, one begins to be suspicious.' I do not mean to suggest that Miss Hart, though it is true she had not yet met Nelson, was fascinated by Tischbein, but we have no reason to suppose that Tischbein was less susceptible than Romney. Altogether, it seems likely enough that the future Lady Hamilton's fine eyes were Tischbein's main reason for not going to Sicily, and afterwards for his sudden exodus to Rome. But why, in this case, did he leave Naples, why go back to rome when goethe was in sicily i hope he went for the purpose of shaking off his infatuation for miss hart i am loath to think he went merely to wind up his affairs in rome i will assume that only after a sharp conflict in which he fought hard on the side of duty against love did he relapse to naples but i won't pretend to wish he had finished that portrait if you know where that portrait is, tell me. I want it. I have tried to trace it, vainly. What became of it? I thought I might find this out in George Henry Lew's Life of Goethe, but Lew's had a hero worship for Goethe. He thought him greater than George Eliot, and in the whole book there is but one cold mention of Tischbein's name. Mr. Oscar Browning, in the Encyclopedia Britannica, names Tischbein as Goethe's constant companion in the early days at Rome, and says nothing else about him. In fact, the hero-worshippers have evidently conspired to hush up the affront to their hero. Even the Penny Cyclopedia, 1842, which devotes a column to the little Tischbein himself, and goes into various details of his career, is silent about the portrait of Goethe. I learned from that column that Tischbein became director of the Neapolitan Academy at a salary of 600 ducats, and resided in Naples until the Revolution of 99, when he returned in haste to Germany. Suppose he passed through Rome on his way. A homing fugitive would not pause to burden himself with a vast, unfinished canvas. We may be sure the canvas remained in that Roman studio an object of mild interest to successive occupants. Is it still there? Does the studio itself still exist? Belike it has been demolished with so much else. What became of the expropriated canvas? It wouldn't have been buried in the new foundations. Someone must have staggered away with it. Whither? Somewhere, I am sure, in some dark vault or cellar, 
it languishes. Seek it, fetch it out, bring it to me in triumph. You will always find me in the baptistry of San Lorenzo. But I have formed so clear and sharp a preconception of the portrait that I am likely to be disappointed at sight of what you bring me. I see in my mind's eye every falling fold of the white mantle, the nobly rounded calf of the leg on which rests the forearm, the highlight on the black silk stocking, the shoes, the hands are rather sketchy, the sky is a mere slab, the ruined temples are no more than adumbrated, but the expression of the face is perfectly, epitomically, that of a great man surveying a great alien scene and gauging its import not without a keen sense of its dramatic conjunction with himself. Marius in Carthage, and Napoleon before the Sphinx, Wordsworth on London Bridge, and Cortez on the Peak of Darien. But most of all, certainly, Goethe in the Campagna. So, you see, I cannot promise to be horribly let down by Tischbein's actual handiwork. I may even have to take back my promise that it shall have a place of honour. But I shall not utterly reject it, unless, on the plea that a collection of unfinished works should itself have some great touch of incompletion. End of section 13。section 14 of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。section 14 。Something Defeasible。July 1919 The cottage had a good trim garden in front of it, and another behind it. I might not have noticed it at all, but for them and their emerald greenness. Yet itself, I saw when I studied it, was worthy of them. Sussex is rich in fine Jacobian cottages, and their example, clearly, had not been lost on the builder of this one. Its proportions had a homely grandeur. It was long and wide and low. It was quite a yard long. It had three admirable gables. It had a substantial and shapely chimney-stack. I liked the look that it had of honest solidity all over. Nothing anywhere scamped in the workmanship of it. It looked as though it had been built for all time. But this was not so, for it was built on sand, and of sand, and the tide was coming in. Here and there, in its vicinity, stood other buildings. None of these possessed any points of interest. They were just old-fashioned castles, of the bald and hasty kind which I myself used to make in childhood, and could make even now. Conic affairs, with or without untidily dug moats. The nullities of convention and of unskilled labor. When I was a child, the charm of a castle was not in the building of it, but in jumping over it when it was built. Nor was this an enduring charm. After a few jumps, one abandoned one's castle, and asked one's nurse for a bun, or picked a quarrel with some child even smaller than oneself, or went paddling. As it was, so it is. My survey of the sands this morning showed me that forty years had made no difference. Here was plenty of animation, plenty of scurrying and gambling, of laughter and tears, but the actual spade-work was a mere empty form, for all but the builder of that cottage. For him, manifestly, a passion, a right. He stood, spade in hand, contemplating, from one angle and another, what he had done. He was perhaps nine years old, if so small for his age. He had very thin legs, in very short grey knickerbockers, a pale freckled face, and hair that matched the sand. He was not remarkable, but with a little good will one can always find something impressive in anybody. 
when mr mallaby dealey won a wide and very sudden fame in connection with covent garden an awe-stricken reporter wrote of him for the daily mail he has the eyes of a dreamer i believe that mr cecil rhodes really had so it seemed to me had this little boy they were pale grey eyes rather prominent with an unwavering light in them i guessed that they were regarding the cottage rather as what it should be than as what it had become to me it appeared quite perfect but i surmised that to him artist that he was it seemed a poor thing beside his first flushed conception he knelt down and partly with the flat of his spade partly with the palm of one hand redressed some to me obscure fault in one of the gables he rose stood back his eyes slowly endorsed the amendment a few moments later very suddenly he scudded away to the adjacent breakwater and gave himself to the task of scraping off it some of the short green seaweed wherewith he had made the cottages two gardens so pleasantly realistic oases so refreshing in the sandy desert were the lawns somehow imperfect anon when he darted back i saw what it was that his taste had required lichen moss for the roof sundry morsels and patches of green he deftly disposed in the angles of roof and gables his stock exhausted off to the breakwater he darted and back again to and fro with the lightning directness of a hermit bee making its nest of pollen the low walls that enclosed the two gardens were in need of creepers little by little this grace was added to them i stood silently watching i kept silent for fear of discommoding him all artists by which i mean of course all good artists are shy they are trustees of something not entrusted to others they bear fragile treasure not safe in a jostling crowd they must be ever wary and especially shy are those artists whose work is apart from words a man of letters can mitigate his embarrassment among us by a certain glibness not so can the man who works through the medium of visual form and colour not so i was sure could the young architect and landscape gardener here creating i would have moved away had i thought my mere presence was a bother to him but i decided that it was not being a grown-up person i did not matter he had no fear that i should offer violence to his work it was his coevals that made him uneasy groups of these would pause in their wild career to stand over him and watch him in a fidgety manner that hinted mischief suppose one of them suddenly jumped on to the cottage fragile treasure this in a quite literal sense and how awfully exposed it was spared however there was even legible on the faces of the stolid little boys who viewed it a sort of reluctant approval some of the little girls seemed to be forming with their lips the word pretty but then they exchanged glances with one another signifying silly no one of either sex uttered any word of praise and so because artists be they never so agoraphobious do want praise i did at length break my silence to this one i think it's splendid i said to him he looked up at me and down at the cottage do you he asked looking up again i assured him that i did and to test my opinion of him i asked whether he didn't think so too he stood the test well i wanted it rather different he answered in what way different he searched his vocabulary more comfortable he found i knew now that he was not merely the architect and builder of the cottage but also by courtesy of imagination its tenant but i was tactful enough not to let him see that i had guessed this deep and delicate secret i did but ask him in a quite general way how the cottage could be better he said that it ought to have a porch but porches tumble in he was too young an artist to accept quite meekly the limits imposed by his material. He pointed along the lower edge of the roof. "'It ought to stick out,' 
he said, meaning that it wanted eaves. I told him not to worry about that. It was the sand's fault, not his. What really is a pity, I said, is that your house can't last forever. He was tracing now on the roof, with the edge of his spade, a criss-cross pattern, to represent tiles, and he seemed to have forgotten my presence and my kindness. "'Aren't you sorry?' I asked, raising my voice rather sharply. "'That the sea is coming in?' He glanced at the sea. "'Yes.' He said this with a lack of emphasis that seemed to me noble, though insincere. The strain of talking in words of not more than three syllables had begun to tell on me. I bade the artist good-bye, wandered away up the half-dozen steps to the parade, sat down on a bench, and opened the morning paper that I had brought out unread. During the war one felt it a duty to know the worst before breakfast. Now that the English polity is threatened merely from within, one is apt to dally. Merely from within? Is that a right phrase, when the nerves of unrestful labor in any one land are interplicated with its nerves in any other so vibrantly? News of the dismissal of an erring workman in Timbuktu is enough nowadays to make us apprehensive of vast and dreadful effects on our own immediate future. How pleasant if we had lived our lives in the nineteenth century, and no other, with the ground all firm under our feet. True, the people who flourished then had recurring alarms, but their alarms were quite needless. Whereas ours, ours, as I glanced at this morning's news from Timbuktu and elsewhere, seemed odiously needful. Withal, our old nobility, in its plaisances, was treading once more the old graceful measure which the war arrested. Bohemia had resumed its motley. Even the middle class was capering very noticeably. To gad about smiling as though he were quite well, thank you, or to sit down, pull a long face, and make his soul, which, I wondered, is the better procedure for a man knowing that very soon he will have to undergo a vital operation at the hands of a wholly unqualified surgeon who dislikes him personally. I inclined to think the gloomier way the less ghastly. But then, I asked myself, was my analogy a sound one? We are at the mercy of labor, certainly, and labor does not love us and labor is not deeply versed in statecraft. But would an unskilled surgeon, however ill-wishing, care to perform a drastic operation on a patient by whose death he himself would forthwith perish? Labor is wise enough, surely, not to will us destruction? Russia has been an awful example, surely. And yet labor does not seem to think the example so awful as I do. Queer, this. Queer and disquieting. I rose from my bench, strolled to the railing, and gazed forth. The unrestful, the well-organized and minatory sea had been advancing quickly. It was not very far now from the cottage. I thought of all the civilizations that had been, that were not, that were as though they had never been. Must it always be thus? Always the same old tale of growth and greatness and overthrow, nothingness? I gazed at the cottage, all so solid and seemly, so full of endearing character, so like to the comfortable polity of England as we have known it. I gazed away from it to a largish castle that the sea was just reaching. A little, then quickly much, the waters swirled into the boat. Many children stood by, all a-dance with excitement. The castle was shedding its sides, lapsing, dwindling, land-slipping, gone. O oh, Nineveh! And now another. O oh, Memphis! Rome yielded to the cataclysm. I listened to the jubilant screams of the children. What rapture! What wantoning! Motionless beside his work stood the builder of the cottage, gazing seaward, a pathetic little figure. 
I hoped the other children would have the decency not to exult over the unmaking of what he had made so well. This hope was not fulfilled. I had not supposed it would be. What did surprise me when anon the sea rolled close up to the cottage was the comportment of the young artist himself. His sobriety gave place to an intense animation. He leapt. He waved his spade. He invited the waves with wild gestures and gleeful cries. His face had flushed bright, and now, as the garden walls crumbled, and the paths and lawns were mingled by the water's influence and confluence, and the walls of the cottage itself began to totter, and the gables sank, and all, all was swallowed, his leaps were so high in air that they recalled to my memory those of a strange religious sect which once visited London, and the glare of his eyes was less indicative of a dreamer than of a triumphant fiend. I myself was conscious of a certain wild enthusiasm within me, but this was less surprising for that I had not built the cottage, and my fancy had not enabled me to dwell in it. It was the boy's own enthusiasm that made me feel, as never before, how deeply rooted in the human breast the love of destruction, of mere destruction, is. And I began to ask myself, even if England as we know it, the English polity of which that cottage was a symbol to me, were the work of Mr. Robert Smiley's own unaided hands, but... I waived the question coming from that hypothesis, and other questions that would have followed, for I wished to be happy while I might. End of section 14、section、fifteen of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section fifteen, a clergyman, nineteen eighteen. Fragmentary, pale, momentary, almost nothing, glimpsed and gone, as it were a faint human hand thrust up, never to reappear from beneath the rolling waters of time. He for ever haunts my memory and solicits my weak imagination. Nothing is told of him but that once abruptly. He asked a question and received an answer. This was on the afternoon of April seventh, seventeen seventy-eight, at Streatham, in the well-appointed house of Mister Thrale. Johnson, on the morning of that day, had entertained Boswell at breakfast in Bolt Court and invited him to dine at Thrale Hall. The two took coach and arrived early. It seems that Sir John Pringle had asked Boswell to ask Johnson what were the best English sermons for style. In the interval before dinner, accordingly, Boswell reeled off the names of several divines whose prose might or might not win commendation. Atterbury, he suggested. Johnson, yes, sir, one of the best. Boswell, Tillotson, Johnson. Why not now? I should not advise any one to imitate Tillotson's style, though I don't know. I should be cautious of censuring anything that has been applauded by so many suffrages. South is one of the best, if you accept his peculiarities and his violence and sometimes coarseness of language. Seed has a very fine style, but he is not very theological. Jorton's sermons are very elegant. Sherlock's style too is very elegant, though he has not made it his principal study. And you may add Smallridge. Boswell, I like Ogden's sermons on prayer very much, both for neatness of style and subtlety of reasoning. Johnson, I should like to read all that Ogden has written. Boswell. What I want to know is what sermons afford the best specimen of English pulpit eloquence. Johnson, we have no sermons addressed to the passions that are good for anything. If you mean that kind of eloquence, a clergyman whose name I do not recollect, 
were not dodd's sermons addressed to the passions johnson they were nothing sir be they addressed to what they may the suddenness of it bang and the rabbit that had popped from its burrow was no more i know not which is the more startling the debut of the unfortunate clergyman or the instantaneousness of his end why hadn't boswell told us there was a clergyman present well we may be sure that so careful and acute an artist had some good reason and i suppose the clergyman was left to take us unawares because just so did he take the company had we been told he was there we might have expected that sooner or later he would join in the conversation he would have had a place in our minds we may assume that in the minds of the company around johnson he had no place he sat forgotten overlooked so that his self-assertion startled every one just as on boswell's page it startles us in johnson's massive and magnetic presence only some very remarkable man such as mr burke was sharply distinguishable from the rest others might if they had something in them stand out slightly this unfortunate clergyman may have had something in him but i judge that he lacked the gift of seeming as if he had that deficiency however does not account for the horrid fate that befell him one of johnson's strongest and most inveterate feelings was his veneration for the cloth to any one in holy orders he habitually listened with a grave and charming deference to-day moreover he was in excellent good humour he was at the thrales where he so loved to be the day was fine a fine dinner was in close prospect and he had had what he always declared to be the sum of human felicity a ride in a coach nor was there in the question put by the clergyman anything likely to enrage him dodd was one whom johnson had befriended in adversity and it had always been agreed that dodd in his pulpit was very emotional what drew the blasting flash must have been not the question itself but the manner in which it was asked and i think we can guess what that manner was say the words aloud were not dodd's sermons addressed to the passions they are words which if you have any dramatic and histrionic sense cannot be said except in a high thin voice you may from sheer perversity utter them in a rich and sonorous baritone or bass but if you do so they sound utterly unnatural to make them carry the conviction of human utterance you have no choice you must pipe them remember now johnson was very deaf even the people whom he knew well the people to whose voices he was accustomed had to address him very loudly it is probable that this unregarded young shy clergyman when at length he suddenly mustered courage to cut in let his high thin voice soar too high inasmuch that it was a kind of scream on no other hypothesis can we account for the ferocity with which johnson turned and rended him johnson didn't we may be sure mean to be cruel the old lion startled just struck out blindly but the force of paws and claws was not the less lethal we have endless testimony to the strength of johnson's voice and the very cadence of those words they were nothing sir be they addressed to what they may convinces me that the old lion's jaws never gave forth a louder roar boswell does not record that there was any further conversation before the announcement of dinner perhaps the whole company had been temporarily deafened but i am not bothering about them my heart goes out to the poor dear clergyman exclusively i said a moment ago that he was young and shy and i admit that i slipped those epithets in without having justified them to you by due process of induction your quick mind will have already supplied what i omitted a man with a high thin voice and without power to impress any one with a sense of his importance 
a man so null in effect that even the retentive mind of boswell did not retain his very name would assuredly not be a self-confident man even if he were not naturally shy social courage would soon have been sapped in him and would in time have been destroyed by experience that he had not yet given himself up as a bad job that he still had faint wild hopes is proved by the fact that he did snatch the opportunity for asking that question he must accordingly have been very young was he the curate of the neighbouring church i think so it would account for his having been invited i see him as he sits there listening to the great doctor's pronouncement on atterbury and those others he sits on the edge of a chair in the background he has colourless eyes fixed earnestly and a face almost as pale as the clerical bands beneath his somewhat receding chin his forehead is high and narrow his hair mouse-coloured his hands are clasped tight before him the knuckles standing out sharply this constriction does not mean that he is steeling himself to speak he has no positive intention of speaking very much nevertheless is he wishing in the back of his mind that he could say something something whereat the great doctor would turn on him and say after a pause for thought why yes sir that is most justly observed or sir this has never occurred to me i thank you thereby fixing the observer for ever high in the esteem of all and now in a flash the chance presents itself we have shouts johnson no sermons addressed to the passions that are good for anything i see the curate's frame quiver with sudden impulse and his mouth fly open and no i can't bear it i shut my eyes and ears but audible even so is something shrill followed by something thunderous presently i reopen my eyes the crimson has not yet faded from that young face yonder and slowly down either cheek falls a glistening tear shades of atterbury and tillotson such weakness shames the established church what would jorton and smallridge have said what seed and south and by the way who were they these worthies it is a solemn thought that so little is conveyed to us by names which to the paleo-georgians conveyed so much we discern a dim composite picture of a big man in a big wig and a billowing black gown with a big congregation beneath him but we are not anxious to hear what he is saying we know it is all very elegant we know it will be printed and be bound in finely tooled full calf and no paleo-georgian gentleman's library will be complete without it literate people in those days were comparatively few but bating that one may say that sermons were as much in request as novels are to-day i wonder will mankind continue to be capricious it is a very solemn thought indeed that no more than a hundred and fifty years hence the novelists of our time with all their moral and political and sociological outlook and influence will perhaps shine as indistinctly as do those old preachers with all their elegance now yes sir some great pundit may be telling a disciple at this moment wells is one of the best galsworthy is one of the best if you accept his concern for delicacy of style mrs ward has a very firm grasp of problems but is not very creational kane's books are very edifying i should like to read all that kane has written miss corelli too is very edifying and you may add upton sinclair what i want to know says the disciple is what english novels may be selected as specially enthralling the pundit answers we have no novels addressed to the passions that are good for anything if you mean that kind of enthralment and here some poor wretch whose name the disciple will not remember inquires are not mrs glynn's novels addressed to the passions and is in due form annihilated 
can it be that a time will come when readers of this passage in our pundit's life will take more interest in the poor nameless wretch than in all the bearers of those great names put together being no more able or anxious to discriminate between say mrs ward and mr sinclair than we are to set ogden above sherlock or sherlock above ogden it seems impossible but we must remember that things are not always what they seem every man illustrious in his day however much he may be gratified by his fame looks with an eager eye to posterity for a continuance of past favours and would even live the remainder of his life in obscurity if by so doing he could ensure that future generations would preserve a correct attitude towards him for ever this is very natural and human but like so many very natural and human things very silly tillotson and the rest need not after all be pitied for our neglect of them they either know nothing about it or are above such terrene trifles let us keep our pity for the seething mass of divines who were not elegantly verbose and had no fun or glory while they lasted and let us keep a specially large portion for one whose lot was so much worse than merely undistinguished if that nameless curate had not been at the thrales that day or being there had kept the silence that so well became him his life would have been drab enough in all conscience but at any rate an unpromising career would not have been nipped in the bud and that is what in fact happened i'm sure of it a robust man might have rallied under the blow not so our friend those who knew him in infancy had not expected that he would be reared better for him had they been right it is well to grow up and be ordained but not if you are delicate and very sensitive and shall happen to annoy the greatest the most stentorian and roughest of contemporary personages a clergyman never held up his head or smiled again after the brief encounter recorded for us by boswell he sank into a rapid decline before the next blossoming of Thrale Hall's almond trees, he was no more. I like to think that he died forgiving, Dr. Johnson. End of section 15、section、16 of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 16. The Crime, 1920. On a bleak, wet, stormy afternoon, at the outset of last year's spring, I was in a cottage, all alone, and knowing that I must be all alone till evening. It was a remote cottage, in a remote country, and had been let furnished by its owner. My spirits are easily affected by weather, and i hate solitude and i dislike to be master of things that are not mine be careful not to break us say the glass and china you'd better not spill ink on me growls the carpet none of your dog's earing thumb marking back breaking tricks here snarl the books the books in this cottage looked particularly disagreeable horrid little upstarts of this and that scarlet or cerulean series of standard authors having gloomily surveyed them i turned my back on them and watched the rain streaming down the latticed window whose panes seemed likely to be shattered at any moment by the wind i have known men who constantly visit the central criminal court visit also the scenes where famous crimes were committed form their own theories of those crimes collect souvenirs of those crimes and call themselves criminologists as for me my interest in crime is alas merely morbid i did not know as those others would doubtless have known that the situation in which i found myself was precisely of the kind most conducive to the darkest deeds 
I did but bemoan it and think of Lear in the hovel on the heath. The wind howled in the chimney, and the rain had begun to sputter right down it, so that the fire was beginning to hiss in a very sinister manner. Suppose the fire went out. It looked as if it meant to. I snatched the pair of bellows that hung beside it. I plied them vigorously. Now mind, not too vigorously. We aren't yours, they wheezed. I handled them more gently, but I did not release them till they had secured me a steady blaze. I sat down before that blaze. Despair had been warded off. Gloom, however, remained, and gloom grew. I felt that I should prefer any one's thoughts to mine. I rose. I returned to the books. A dozen or so of those which were on the lowest of the three shelves were full-sized, were octavo, looked as though they had been bought to be read. I would exercise my undoubted right to read one of them. Which of them? I gradually decided on a novel by a well-known writer whose works, though I had several times had the honour of meeting her, were known to me only by repute. I knew nothing of them that was not good. The lady's output had not been at all huge, and it was agreed that her level was high. I had always gathered that the chief characteristic of her work was its great vitality. The book in my hand was a third edition of her latest novel, and at the end of it were numerous press notices, at which I glanced for confirmation. Immense vitality, yes, said one critic. Full, said another, of an intense vitality. A book that will live, said a third. How on earth did he know that? I was, however, very willing to believe in the vitality of this writer for all present purposes, Vitality was a thing in which she herself, her talk, her glance, her gestures, abounded. She and they had been, I remembered, rather too much for me. The first time I met her, she said something that I lightly and mildly disputed. On no future occasion did I stem any opinion of hers. Not that she had been rude, far from it. She had but, in a sisterly, brotherly way, and yet in a way that was filially eager, too, asked me to explain my point. I did my best. She was all attention. But I was conscious that my best, under her eye, was not good. She was quick to help me. She said for me just what I had tried to say, and proceeded to show me just why it was wrong. I smiled the gallant smile of a man who regards women as all the more adorable because logic is not their strong point. Bless them. She asked, not aggressively, but strenuously, as one who dearly loves a joke, what I was smiling at. Altogether a chastening encounter, and my memory of it was tinged with a feeble resentment. How she had scored! No man likes to be worsted in an argument by a woman, and I fancy that to be vanquished by a feminine writer is the kind of defeat least of all agreeable to a man who writes. A sex war, we are often told, is to be one of the features of the world's future, women demanding the right to do men's work, and men refusing, resisting, counter-attacking. It seems likely enough, one can believe anything of the world's future, yet one conceives that not all men, if this particular evil come to pass, will stand packed shoulder to shoulder against all women. One does not feel that the dockers will be very bitter against such women as want to be miners, or the plumbers frown much upon the would-be steeple jills. I myself have never had my sense of fitness jarred, nor a spark of animosity roused in me by a woman practicing any of the fine arts, except the art of writing. 
that she should write a few little poems or pensées, or some impressions of a trip in a dahabier as far as, say, Biskra, or even a short story or two, seems to me not wholly amiss, even though she do such things for publication. But that she should be an habitual professional author, with a passion for her art, and a fountain pen, and an agent, and sums down in advance of royalties on sales in Canada and Australia, and a profound knowledge of human character, and an essentially sane outlook, is, somehow, incongruous with my notions, my mistaken notions, if you will, of what she ought to be. Has a profound knowledge of human character, and an essentially sane outlook said one of the critics quoted at the end of the book that i had chosen the wind and the rain in the chimney had not abated but the fire was bearing up bravely so would i i would read cheerfully and without prejudice i poked the fire and pushing my chair slightly back lest the heat should warp the book's covers began chapter one a woman sat writing in a summer-house at the end of a small garden that overlooked a great valley in Surrey. The description of her was calculated to make her very admirable, a thorough woman, not strictly beautiful, but likely to be thought beautiful by those who knew her well, not dressed as though she gave much heed to her clothes, but dressed in a fashion that exactly harmonized with her special type. Her pen travelled rapidly across the fool's cap, and while it did so she was described in more and more detail. But at length she came to a knotty point in what she was writing. She paused. She pushed back the hair from her temples. She looked forth at the valley. And now the landscape was described, but not at all exhaustively for the writer soon overcame her difficulty, and her pen travelled faster than ever, till suddenly there was a cry of, Mammy! and in rushed a seven-year-old child, in conjunction with whom she was more than ever admirable. After which the narrative skipped back across eight years, and the woman became a girl, giving as yet no token of future eminence in literature, but i had an impulse which i obeyed almost before i was conscious of it nobody could have been more surprised than i was at what i had done done so neatly so quietly and gently the book stood closed upright with its back to me just as on a bookshelf behind the bars of the grate there it was and it gave forth as the flames crept up the blue cloth sides of it a pleasant though acrid smell my astonishment had passed giving place to an exquisite satisfaction how pottering and fumbling a thing was even the best kind of written criticism i understood the contempt felt by the man of action for the man of words but what pleased me most was that at last actually i at my age i of all people had committed a crime was guilty of a crime i had power to revoke it i might write to the bookseller for an unburnt copy and place it on the shelf where this one had stood this gloriously glowing one i would do nothing of the sort what i had done i had done i would wear for ever on my conscience the white rose of theft and the red rose of arson if hereafter the owner of this cottage happened to miss that volume let him if he were fool enough to write to me about it would i share my grand secret with him no gently with his poker i prodded that volume further among the coals the all but consumed binding shot forth little tongues of bright colour flamelets of sapphire amethyst emerald charming could even the author herself not admire them 
perhaps poor woman i had scored now scored so perfectly that i felt myself to be almost a brute while i poked off the loosened black outer pages and let the fire on to pages that were but pale brown these were quickly devoured but it seemed to me that whenever i left the fire to forage for itself it made little headway i pushed the book over on its side the flames closed on it but presently licking their lips fell back as though they had had enough i took the tongs and put the book upright again and raked it fore and aft it seemed almost as thick as ever with poker and tongs i carved it in two three sections the inner pages flashing white as when they were sent to the binders strange aforetime a book was burnt now and again in the market-place by the common hangman was he i wondered paid by the hour i had always supposed the thing quite easy for him a bright little brisk little conflagration and so home perhaps other books were less resistant than this one i began to feel that the critics were more right than they knew here was a book that had indeed an intense vitality and an immense vitality it was a book that would live do what one might i vowed it should not i subdivided it spread it redistributed it ever and anon my eye would be caught by some sentence or fragment of a sentence in the midst of a charred page before the flames crept over it always loathed you but i remember and think tolstoy was right who had always loathed whom and what what had tolstoy been right about i had an absurd but genuine desire to know too late confound the woman she was scoring again i furiously drove her pages into the yawning crimson jaws of the coals those jaws had lately been golden soon to my horror they seemed to be growing grey they seemed to be closing on nothing flakes of black paper full-sized layers of paper brown and white began to hide them from me altogether i sprinkled a box full of wax matches i resumed the bellows i lunged with the poker i held a newspaper over the whole grate i did all that inspiration could suggest or skill accomplish vainly the fire went out darkly dismally gradually quite out how she had scored again but she did not know it i felt no bitterness against her as i lay back in my chair inert listening to the storm that was still raging i blamed only myself i had done wrong the small room became very cold whose fault was that but my own i had done wrong hastily but had done it and been glad of it i had not remembered the words a wise king wrote long ago that the lamp of the wicked shall be put out and that the way of transgressors is hard end of section sixteen Section 17 of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 17. In Homes Unblessed. 1919. Nothing is more pleasant than to see, suddenly endowed with motion, a thing stagnant by nature. The hat that on the head of the man in the street is nothing to us how much is it if it be animated by a gust of wind there is no churl that does not rejoice with it in its strength and in the swiftness and cunning that baffle its pursuer who he too when the chase is over bears it no ill-will at all for its escapade 
I know families that have sat for hours, for hours after bedtime, mute, in a dim light, pressing a table with their fingertips, and ever bringing to bear the full force of their minds on it, in the unconquerable hope that it would move. Conversely, nothing is more dismal than to see, set in permanent rigidness, a thing whose aspect is linked for us with the idea of great mobility. Even the blithest of us, and least easily depressed, would make a long detour to avoid a stuffed squirrel or a case of pinned butterflies. And you can well imagine with what a sinking of the heart I beheld this morning on a road near the coast of Norfolk, a railway car without wheels. Without wheels though it was, it had motion of a kind, of a kind worse than actual stagnation, mounted on a very long steam lorry that groaned and panted. It very slowly passed me. I noticed that two of its compartments were marked first, the rest third and in some of them i noted you might smoke but of this opportunity you were not availing yourself all the compartments the cheap and the dear alike were vacant they were transporting air only and this i conceived abominable the sun slanted fiercely down on the old iron roof the old wooden walls the dingy shut windows the fume and grime of a thousand familiar tunnels, of year after year of journeys by night, journeys by day, from time immemorial, seemed to have invested the whole structure with a character that shrank from the sun's scrutiny, and from the nearness of the sea and fields. Fuliginous, monstrous, slowly, shamefully, the thing went by, to what final goal in the lovely weather? There attended it, besides the driver of the lorry, a straggling retinue of half a dozen men on foot, handy-looking mechanics, very dusty. I should have liked to question one or another of these as to their mission, but I was afraid to do so. There is an art of talking acceptably to people who do not regard themselves as members of one's own class, and I have never acquired it. I suppose the first step is to forget that any art is needed, to forget that one must not be so wildly cordial for fear of seeming to condescend, nor be more than a trifle saturnine either for the same motive. Or am I wrong? The whole thing is a mystery to me. All I know is that if I had asked those mechanics what they were doing with that railway car, they would have seemed to suspect me of meaning that it was my property, and that they had stolen it. Or, perhaps, they would have seemed merely to resent my idle curiosity. If so, why not? When I walk abroad with a sheaf of manuscript in my hand, mechanics do not stop me to ask, what's that, what's it about, who's going to publish it? Nor is this because, times have changed so, they are afraid of seeming to condescend. They always did mind their own business, and now that their own business is so much more lucrative than mine, they still follow that golden rule. I stood gazing back at the procession till it disappeared round a bend of the road. Its bequest of dust and smoke was quickly spent by a prodigal young breeze. Landscape and seascape were re-endued with their full amenities. Ruskin would have been pleased. So, indeed, was I. But that railway car, in which, it romantically struck me, I myself might once, might frequently, have travelled, was still upmost in my brooding mind. To what manner of wretched end was it destined? No end would have seemed bad enough for it to Ruskin, but I was born late enough to acquiesce in railways and in all that pertains to them, and now, since the success of motor-cars, those far greater because unrestricted bores, railways have taken on for me some such charm 
as the memory of the posting coaches had for the greybeards of my boyhood some such charm as aeroplanes may in the fullness of time foist down for us on motor-cars but i rove like sir thomas moore and i seem to think that a cheap literary illusion will make you excuse that vice to resume my breathless narrative i decided that i would slowly follow the tracks of the lorry i supposed that these were leading me to some great scrapping place filled with the remains of other railway cars foully scrapped for some fell industrial purpose but this was a bad guess the tracks led me at last through a lane and hence into sight of a little bay on whose waters were perceptible the deck heads of sundry human beings and on its sands the full lengths of sundry other human beings in bathrobes reading novels or merely basking there was nowhere any sign of industrialism more than ever was i intrigued as to the fate of the old railway car that i had been stalking it and its lorry had halted on the flat grassy land that fringed the sands this land was dominated by a crescent of queer little garish tenements the like of which i had never seen nor would wish to see again they did not stand on the ground but on stakes of wood and shafts of brick six feet or so above the ground's level and were led up to by flights of wooden steps that tried not to look like ladders they displeased me much they had little railed platforms round them and things hanging out to dry on the railings and their walls vied unneighbourly with one another in lawless colour schemes one tenement was salmon pink with wide bands of scarlet another sky blue with a key pattern in orange and so on around the whole little horrid array and i deduced from certain upstanding stakes and shafts at the nearer end of the crescent that the horror was not complete a suspicion dawned in me and became while i gazed again at the crescent's facades a glaring certainty in the light of which i saw that i had been wrong about the old railway car defunct it was not to die it was to have a new function i had once heard that disused railway cars were convertible into seaside cottages but the news had not fired my imagination nor protruded in my memory to-day as an eye-witness of the accomplished fact i was impressed sharply enough and i went nearer to the crescent drawn by a sort of dreadful fascination i found that the cottages all had names one cottage was mermaid's rock another which had fluttering window curtains of stuart tartan spray o the sun another the nest another briny nook and yet another had been named with less fitness but in an ampler and to me more interesting spirit petworth i looked from them to the not yet converted railway car it had a wonderful dignity in its austere and monumental way it was very beautiful it was a noble work of man and nature smiled on it i wondered with what colours it was to be be jezebel and what name bolton abbey glad eye gay wee gehenna it would have to bear and what manner of man or woman was going to rent it it was on this last point that i mused especially the housing problem is hard doubtless but nobody my mind protested as i surveyed the crescent nobody is driven to so desperate a solution of it as this there are tents there are caves there are hollow trees and there are people who prefer this yes this is a positive taste not a necessity at all i swept the bay with a searching eye but heads on the surface of water tell nothing to the sociologists and in bathrobes even full lengths on the sand give him no clue 
Three or four of the full lengths had risen and strolled up to the lorry, around which the mechanics were engaged in some dispute of a technical nature. I hoped the full lengths would have something to say, too. But they said nothing. This I sat down to sheer perversity. I was more than three miles from the place where I am sojourning, and the hour for luncheon was nearly due. I left the bay without having been able to determine the character, the kind, of its denizens. I take it there is a strong tincture of bohemianism in them. Mr. Desmond McCarthy, of whose judgment I am always trustful, has said that the hallmark of bohemianism is a tendency to use things for purposes to which they are not adapted. You are a bohemian, says Mr. McCarthy, if you would gladly use a razor for buttering your toast at breakfast. And you aren't if you wouldn't. I think he would agree that the choice of a home is a surer index than any fleeting action, however strange, and that, really, the best certified bohemians are they who choose to reside in railway cars on stilts. But why particularly railway cars? That is a difficult question. A possible answer is that the bohemian, as tending always to nomadi, feels that the least uncongenial way of settling down is to stow himself into a thing fashioned for darting hither and thither. Yet, no, this answer won't do. It is ruled out by the law I laid down in my first paragraph. There is nothing sadder to the eye or heart than a very mobile thing made immovable. No house, especially if you are by way of being nomadic, can be so ill to live in as one that, in its heyday, went gadding all over the place. And, on the other hand, what house more eligible than one that can gad? I myself am not restless, and am fond of comfort. I should not care to live in a caravan, but I have always liked the idea of a caravan. And if you, alas, O oh reader, are a dweller in a railway car, I commend the idea to you. Take it, with my apologies for any words of mine that may have nettled you, put it into practice. Think of the white road and the shifting hedgerows, and the counties that you will soon lose count of. And think what a blessing it will be for you to know that your house is not the one in which the Merstham Tunnel murder was committed. End of section 17